She's a real woman with a real life. She's someone you can relate to. Dawn Newton. Welcome to the Don Newton Podcast. I am your host, Don Newton. My guest today is Sharon G. Flake. She is a young adult author. She's also a three-time Coretta Scott King award-winning author. Over 20 years ago, her debut novel, The Skin I'm In, had a tremendous impact, which has stood the test of time continuing to influence teens, parents, teachers, and educators. Sharon takes on tough issues around race, self-esteem, self-protection, and empowerment. Now, over 20 years later, Sharon brings us her powerful and long anticipated sister novel, The Life I'm In. Told from the perspective of the bully in The Skin I'm In, The Life I'm In presents the unflinching story of Shar, a young woman trapped in the underworld of human trafficking. Sharon Flake, it is such an honor to speak with you. Congratulations on your work, a, a novelist, a best-selling author, I should say, three-time Coretta Scott King award-winning author, Thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you. I am happy and pleased to be with you, Dawn. The book we're talking about today is The Life I'm In, which is a sister novel to the best-selling The Skin I'm In, which was published over 20 years ago in 1998. Published over 20 years ago. There's over a million copies of that book in print. <laughs> educators so around. want it. Teachers, educators, This the book really, um, it, it's, it really made a mark for itself and touched a lot of lives. It did. Absolutely. Um, young people uh, have been reading it for over a generation, right? And so now I have people in their 30s who are, believe it or not, buying it for their toddlers and their babies and saying, I'm going to put it on a shelf and save it for them. And then you have six-year-olds reading it. You have high school students reading it. You have people writing about it in their PhDs. It's about a dark-skinned girl who gets picked on um, because of how she looks. So it becomes a novel about Loving the skin you're in, uh, standing up for yourself, and finding your voice. Where did the idea come from for this book? You know, I tell people I gave birth 33 years ago to a dark skin girl. Um, I call her my dark skin beauty. And from that moment, I was writing before that inconsistently, right? You know, today, three weeks from now or something like that. <laughs> um, but once Brittany showed up on the planet, I just... I was in, I was consistent, I was pretty regular, and I would tell her stories, even as a toddler, about brown-skinned girls who could solve crimes and, and fly through the sky, and, you know, they'd have braids with beads in them, and they'd shake their hair, and bling, 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 you know. <laughs> so I wanted her to know that who she was and how she showed up on the planet was exactly the way God planned it, and that she was wonderful just the way she was. I knew about colorism in our community, but it's also in the Indian community, right? It's also in Native American communities and other communities, Latinx communities. I will tell you that even though I knew it was a big deal, after I got published, I realized how big a deal it was. And also, I realized that the book has a lot of meaning for a lot of different people. So for maybe an African-American, it might be about your complexion. But for someone else, even African-American, it might be for your weight. So you go to schools and you run into all types of kids in the city, in the suburbs, uh, in private schools who say, this is my story, the skin I'm in. I'm being bullied or teased because they don't like my hair. They don't like my teeth. They don't like my shoes. They say I'm a little person. And I say that specifically because I went to a school and a girl said, She was a little person, but people called her something else, and it was derogatory, and she didn't like it. So I get to have all these conversations with young people in community with young people about what it's like to be them uh, and stand in your shoes. And who is this book about? Is this, Sharon, do we see you in in these characters? In the skin I'm in? The skin I'm in, the life I'm in, where... 
Did the Where do I show up? Yeah. <laughs> I don't show up a whole whole lot in the skin I'm in. <laughs> but I will tell people the part of Malika that's that's the protagonist in the skin I'm in that feels small and little. The feeling of her is me, not her experiences. So every school I go to, kids think, were you bullied? Were you? I wasn't bullied. And then there's a teacher that helps Malika find her voice in a way, along with her, her Malika's father. There's a piece of me in her who is sort of, I was in public relations, she's in public relations. I could be really firm and, you know, okay, everybody get it together. Let's do it this way. So I, I, I run the gamut between Malika and the teacher. In the life I'm in, a very different book. In my first book, The Skin I'm In, people always ask whatever became of the bully. They were concerned about her. Her parents were both deceased and they were killed in a brutal way. She had failed seventh grade a couple of times. Her sister gave parties where grown ups were roaming around and Char was serving drinks. So people were concerned about her. And they for years asked, are you ever going to write a story, a follow-up novel? And I always said no. And then, like, maybe a year before The Life I'm In came out, someone asked me that question again. And for the first time, I said, no, but if I did, (laughs) it would be about Charlize Jones and human trafficking. And so some people ask, why human trafficking? Two reasons. I felt there were some aspects of Char's life that would make her vulnerable to trafficking. And in my research, I found that only one encounter with human services, child and youth services is called in some cities, can make a kid vulnerable to trafficking. And so I knew there were some aspects of her life that made her vulnerable, but as a mom and as a woman, I have been seeing, like you probably, Dawn, have been seeing this uptick in human trafficking. It turns out it's a $150 billion global business. Yeah, I think the the naivete thinking in this day and age, this is still happening. And it seems like it's more prevalent today than it ever has been. It's, I think it's more prevalent and it, there's more conversations about it from radio stations like yours to TV programs to books and also to faith-based organizations getting involved uh, with other organizations and taking this on. So it's more prevalent. I think there are more and more people that are concerned about it and trying to intervene. Um, and I think you need to know what it looks like and know what it is so that you can intervene or you can recognize it as well. What age group, Sharon, are your books for? They are all up and down the map. For this one, it's 14 years old and up. What might surprise people is also a lot of adults read young adult novels now and have been reading my work for a lot of years. So I recently had someone say, I think this would be a great mother-daughter book um, across the generations to read and talk about some of the issues in the book. Trafficking is a big issue in the book. Shar runs away. Um, she ends up being trafficked. Because you run away, that shouldn't happen to you. She's a kid. She's a teenager. They don't make the best of decisions as adults. We're responsible for taking care of them and watching it out for them, even when we don't, even when we don't necessarily know them, sort of trying to be a shepherd to them. And so she, she runs away and she gets trafficked. It's about other things as well. It's about second chances and redemption. From the very beginning of the book, you realize that Shar is trying to change the course of her life. But again, she's a kid. She needs us to help her get to that other side. You know, at one point, Shar is talking to God and she's mad at God. So I also want people to think about, you know, where is God in our mess? Whether we would create the mess or the mess is created for us, where is he? And in this book, A few angels show up, not literal angels, but individuals like you, Dawn, and like me, who can step into the space of other people's lives and help them on their journey. It might be for five seconds. There are organizations that give, I think it's called the soap campaign, so that if you go into a restroom at a public place sometimes, there will be the name of an organization that might be able to help you if you if you've been trafficked. So there's somebody that does that in the book, but they're just there for a, a blink. There's a bus driver that helps Char along the way. So part of the message is a big part trafficking, but it's all these other messages too. Yeah, I think we refer to them as earth angels, and, and I totally get what you're saying. People that come in, in and out of our life. That. For, I'm use that from now on. Yeah, I just, you know, people that just a, a happenstance uh, for maybe a longer period, a short period, that do 
when we reflect on it, they do change the trajectory of our lives. You know, if somebody, if that person hadn't said that to me, I would have gone this other direction or... Oh, absolutely. It happened to me. I was going to go to a different campus for um, college. I was going to go to the University of Pittsburgh, but a far off campus, little bitty one. (laughs) And the counselor says, I don't think you want to go there. I think you want to go to the main campus. And I think, you know, that's where I discovered that I was good at writing and I loved writing. And so I think just pointing me to a different space made all the difference. Well, in talking to you about Char, the main character, the character in The Life I'm In, in, in The Skin I'm In, she was a bully. And right. you know, in this book, we, we look at everything from Char's perspective. And I like when you wrote that bullies aren't made. They don't just, just appear. They're mean for a reason. And I think right. sitting back and that's something, what made this person this way when we, what's happened to you that you're so angry or you're so whatever we want to label it or the behavior that I, I love that you, you approached it from that angle, from Shar's view. From Shar's view, um, yep, bullies are bullies for a reason. And also to have people look at her holistically, which is why I'm loving some of the feedback for the life I'm in that people, all of these emotions, all these ways of seeing her. In this book, Char can be angry. And and I want young people to know, you know what? There are times when you are going to be angry and you have a right to be angry. In this book, she is a caretaker. People would never expect that to be a part of her temperament or her personality. And while she is someone that people are reaching out to and trying to help. She's not just an empty vessel because sometimes when we're dealing with young people who might be bruised or hurt or going through things, we have a tendency, let's fill them up like a pot that we need to put all this stuff in. And we forget that they come with some values, personality, and some interesting components in themselves, invaluable components. And I'm hoping people will see that and show her too as she begins to reach out and help some other people around her. Teenagers, you know, even into their early 20s, look and act like adults. They can, they're, you know, once you become 18, you're considered an adult to the world and, and all these, you know, adult type things. But their mm-hmm. brains are not completely developed. And I think we as adults put a lot of expectation on teens, which there's some pieces where we should, but other pieces of it is whether there's been trauma, hardship, whatever these young people have endured, they're not quite equipped yet to understand what they've gone through, how to express it, how to internalize it, this acting out that comes out that sometimes even they don't understand why they're doing what they're doing. Exactly. They don't know how to process that um, what's happening around them, what might be happening to them physically and, and emotionally. And oftentimes we do judge and, oh, her dress is too short, it's too tight. He, you know, doesn't walk the way we think he should walk. And I think black youth, African-American youth, youth of color are especially judged harshly and given less grace and seen more as a threat. And that's why I think novels like mine, The Skin I'm In, The Life I'm In, other novels by black writers are a good way for people to be a, be sort of in the community, to see and better understand those young people and their stories, to laugh with them sometimes, to cry with them sometimes, to process a little bit differently than you might otherwise. Sharon, what has this work meant to you? Wow, that's a first. You know, I feel like, I don't know if you used it. <laughs> I feel like I died and went to heaven Aww. being a young adult, being a writer for children and young adults. Partly because for myself, I was sort of, probably don't use this term anymore, shrinking violet. I was, I felt small and little, even as an adult, even in my 40s. I still struggle with a voice in my head that says, oh, you're not enough. You don't get it right. And so writing from that perspective and sort of trying to help young people as I give them good stories process their way through life is important to me. Having been on the road for all these years, and young people were some of the first people I told my stuff to, right? Appropriately so, uh, about being scared, about feeling little, about not being a great speller, a writer, uh, along the way. And as a result, they started sharing their lives with me in terms of, you know, Miss Flake, 
I'm struggling with writing too. Oh, I'm not that good with math or I'm really good at this, but I don't know how to do that. And so it's always been this, I think, great relationship between me and the young people I've gone to visit. I think it's about 200,000 at this point or more. And the ones that write me and, you know, and find their way to my books. And what I love, love, again, is that they're growing up. A lot of them, they're grown and they're reaching back and saying, hey, your book changed my life. Well, I would say, Sharon, that uh, you are definitely one we would call an earth angel. <laughs> you are, no matter where you go, just spreading that empowerment, touching those lives, the encouragement. We need more of that. We need more Sharons. Well, thank you, Dawn. That's a, I bet that's a, one of the nicest things anybody ever said to me. I really appreciate that. Well, you are so deserving of those words and many more. Sharon, where can we learn more about you and find your books? Well, you can um, visit my website at slake.sharon at gmail. I'm on Facebook. I'm on uh, Instagram. You can buy my books online at Amazon, walk into a Barnes & Noble or any independent bookstore. If they don't have them, ask them to order them. They will order them for you. Well, I appreciate this time. Thank you so much. I thank you, Dawn. I appreciate it so much. You enjoy your day. Hey, thanks for listening to the Dawn Newton Podcast. I'd also like to thank my special guest, Sharon G. Flake. To learn more about Sharon and her other work, you can visit her website, which is SharonGFlake.com. And be sure to visit my website, DawnNewton.org. The Dawn Newton Podcast is written, produced, and hosted by Dawn Newton. Oh,